y'all are awesome. You guys are great. You can, you can be seated. You can be seated. Hey, how many first-time visitors do we have? You raise your hand. Let me see you. Yeah. No. No. <laughs> That's all right. Yes. Welcome. Where else? Where else? Welcome, guys. We're so happy that you're here. Let's see you out there. If we haven't met, my name is Serena, and uh, I am the young adult pastor here, and it's my honor and privilege to just be with you guys, meet with you guys every single Thursday. How about them strows? Have we won yet? I know some of y'all are checking your phones. I know you're checking. Have we won yet? Not yet, huh? Not yet. Okay. It's too early. It's too early. Well, shout out to Lakewood Music again. Love our people. Lakewood Music. You know what's really cool is I've known many of them for a very, very, very long time. And to see how God is using our house. Like they're literally representatives of our house as they go out on tour to these various cities. And so I love to see how God is using them. Um, and many of them, I have seen them serve in youth and young adults. And so God's just doing a great work in our people. And so we're so proud of them. So the next time you see them or whatever, keep the, you know what? Let's pray for them as they go out, right? Like keep them in your, keep them in your prayers. But uh, we're so proud of them. And yeah. Let me see if the buzz of retreat is still in the room. Do we? Okay. Do we have any outlaws in the room? How about the stallions? And what about the Texans? <laughs> All right. I just wanted to make sure you were still here. Guys, we're going to do something. Uh, we haven't done this on a Thursday night, but if you have your Bible, a physical Bible, pull it out. If you have it on your phone, great, pull it out. We do something here. This is kind of a tradition here at our, in our house, and I think it's fitting for us to do this even tonight. So you know what to do. The words are going to be on the screen. Pull your Bible out. Would you repeat after me? It's, hopefully it will be on the screen, but this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today, where's the rest of it, guys? Word of God, I believe. My heart is receptive. I'll never be the same. I'm about to receive the indestructible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the word of God. I'll never be the same. I'll never be the same. Great job. Wow. I was just checking, you know, just testing y'all to see if you knew it or not. Amazing, amazing. Great job. Everyone's awake. Hey, listen, what I'm going to share with you tonight is not uh, rocket science. It's not something so new. In fact, I believe that it's something that we all need and use and every single day is basic decision making. But not just making the right decision. It's really about knowing how to respond in any given situation. So if you're taking notes tonight, I titled this message, what to do when you don't know what to do. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to read verses 1 through 11. Many of you know this story. This is where Jesus is tested in the wilderness. So Matthew chapter 4, it reads, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, If you're the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, had him stand on the highest point of the temple. He said, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it's written, he will command his angels concerning you and they'll lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is also written, 
do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will just bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended to him. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for your word, your unchanging, undeniable word. And God, I just pray right now, Father, that everything that we read, everything that is spoken, Father, that you want to be spoken, Father, let it come from you, from your heart to your people. God, I pray that tonight we would hold on to your word, God. God, it is the answer when we don't have the answer. And so tonight I pray that, Father, we would discover just a true love for your word. And Father, I pray that even after tonight, we would know what to do in those moments when we don't know what to do. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. All right, now there are like way too many things to pull from this passage. There's 11 verses, but I don't know about you, if you're like me, when I read this, the very first verse is what always stands out to me when I read this. And so let's read it. It says, and Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. Do you know that sometimes you can be led into the wild by the Spirit of God? See, Jesus, literally, he was led into this dry and desolate and waterless, almost lifeless place. And right after, if you don't believe me, read it, he was on the banks of the Jordan River. He just got baptized, chapter 3, the end of chapter 3. He, 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 he was in the water. The heavens opened up. A dove ascended and rested upon him. And, and a light shone down from heaven. And an audible voice from heaven said, This is my son whom I love, in whom I am well pleased. So Jesus goes from the, the most awe-affirming holiest of holy moment to now one of the deadest places that he could be in. Maybe you understand what I mean. One day, right, you're having this incredible God encounter. Like God is so near. You sense him. You feel him. You hear him. He's all around you. He's around the people that you know. <clears throat> Retreat. But then the next moment, the next moment, you're like, wait, what? Did, did that happen? Did, did, was that real? And you're like, how did I get here? <laughs> After I just experienced that. Now, a few things to note here, and I think it's so important, is that Jesus was not tempted by God so God could examine him. In fact, God just approved of him, right? We know that from chapter 3. Jesus was tempted for our sake so that he might personally show us what it looks like to be tempted and then yet get out of the temptation. He overcame the devil by the same weapons and tools that we have available to us today. It's the word of God, it's the power of the spirit, and it's through prayer. So now we have Jesus, he's led into this place. It's low, it's desolate. And it kind of makes me wonder how sometimes we ask God to take us out of situations that we were led to by God himself to face. And you say, you know, maybe I've done this, God, but this is hard. And God goes, well, yeah, I know, but you got this. And so we say, okay, God, use me. And he goes, okay, I will. And then trouble comes. It gets hard. And we're like, God, 
why am I in this place? Like, why did you bring me here? God, remove me from this place. And God says, listen, I know in this world you will have trouble, but take heart because I've overcome the world. Sometimes we ask God to remove us from situations when, in fact, the prayer that we should be praying is, God, give me the endurance. God, get, give me the perseverance. God, let, let, me, let me push through. Say prayers like David did, that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because your rod and your staff protects me. One thing that I find so interesting about this is that Jesus, not once does he ask God to take him out of the de desert. Did you notice that? Not once. He doesn't even complain while he's in the desert. Like, God, it's hot here. I'm hungry. It's hot. The Bible says he was just led by the Spirit. He was just led by the Spirit into the desert, into the wilderness. Like it was just a natural thing for him. It was like this everyday thing. And that got me thinking, if we're going to grow, if we're going to mature in our faith with God, we are going to be led. We're going to need to be led by the Spirit of God. Not, not by our emotions, not by the things that we feel, but to be led by the Spirit of God. And sometimes I realize that we don't want to be led by God because we kind of don't want to relinquish control. It's true. It's not that you're a control freak. Some of you are like, I am a control freak. No, it's because it's hard to trust anyone other than yourself because you know you're going to make the safest choice because maybe you've been let down by a few people. And so you think that your choice, your, you know, your way might be the safest option. But how can I be led by the spirit of God, Serena? Well, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, we got to start embracing the path that is ahead, all right? So let's say this. A lot of people ask me, how do I know if I'm in God's will? Well, let's say, if you, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, you've now asked him, you've invited him into your decisions. You said, God, help me. Where do I go? What decision do I make? How do I do? What do I do? God, please help me every step of the way. And so what you do is you just start embracing the steps ahead, like you've already invited him in. And so therefore, by faith, you believe that you are walking in his will. Proverbs says that many are the plans of man, but it's the Lord that directs his steps. And so if you ask the Lord, God, direct my steps, then start walking and knowing that he's with you. I just, I just keep thinking about Jesus in this, in this passage. And I think, I think Jesus, he, you know, he's obviously the epitome, right? He, he's the greatest example. And Jesus just kind of walked like he, he understood the ebbs and the flows of life. He understood the highs and the lows, right? So many times we get thrown off course when we experience those things. But Jesus, like, he's just like, all right. You know, I got this. And I think the model that he's, he, the, what he's trying to model to us is, God, I'm going to put my trust in you. Even though I don't know what the answer is, I still trust you, God. God, even though I, I'm scared and I don't know what it looks like ahead, God, I'm still going to trust you, God. God, I'm still going to believe in you. I'm still going to believe that your plan is better than my plan. Like Jesus, some days you might feel like you're in that Jordan River. Man, the water is refreshing. There is a public affirmation of you. You audibly hear God affirming you. And everyone else around sees that too. There's a light on your life. And then other days, you're in the desert. <laughs> There's no dove that's ascending down from heaven. There's no light like it is you and it is your creator. See, Jesus in the desert here, what it models to you and I is that this is the place. The desert, the desert is the place where Jesus got his strength. 
See, the world might look at that and be like, no, he was weak. And, and that leads me to three quick points. So if you're taking notes, you can write this down. This is how the enemy comes. Number one, he comes when you're tired. So clearly we know verse 2. It says, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. He was hungry, sure. He was tired. But the reality is that Jesus was fasting, which he was denying himself from something. So that it was in the physical world that he was denying himself. For 40 days, 40 nights, he didn't eat anything. He didn't drink anything. But what he was doing was he was getting strong in his spirit. It makes me think, you know, the world defines our strength from the outside. But your father in heaven, he sees you from the inside out. And so what Jesus tells us here, what he's showing us here is that when you don't have the strength, use God's written word. Three times in this passage, he says, for it's written, it is written. It is written. There's some, here's something that, that, that's very, very practical. I like practical application, right? And, and this might not be new to you. But I would just encourage you to start getting the word of God out in front of you. Like, it may sound old school. It may sound like, man, Serena, I don't, I don't know about that. But why not? Why not write down certain passages and promises? I used to write things down on my hand. And I would just, like, remember that verse for the day, right? Maybe for you, you might write it down on your mirror. Put it by your bedside. Make it the, the, the lock screen on your iPad, on your, on your phone, whatever it may look like. But we have to get the word normalized in our system and around us because sometimes we're, we're so quick to, if I'm standing in a line, I will be quick to pull my phone out and just like start scrolling, right? But what if I was just like quick to just open up my phone and just see a verse and remember it? Normalize seeing the word in front of you. Moving along, we're going to hit the second way that the enemy tries to come at us. He comes to distort the truth. He uses the very word of God to bring chaos and to bring confusion. Verse 6, if you read it, it says he will command his angels concerning you. This is the devil talking to Jesus. He's like, throw yourself down. He, for it's written, he's going to command his angels concerning you. They're going to lift up their hands and, and they won't let you strike your foot. Well, we don't, many of you might know this or you might not. What the devil actually does here is he's reciting what David says in Psalm 91. David said these exact words. That he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. But what he does is he misinterprets the word of God and then he hopes to use it towards his own advantage to trick Jesus. And this isn't alarming to me. That's what the enemy does. He always comes after the truth and he tries to replace it with, with a version of the real thing. All right, we're going to do a little exercise. Y'all awake? Okay, here we go. Pay attention. Here in my hand, I have, I have two $100 bills, and I have a dollar bill. Raise your hand if you want it. Okay, I'm, I, I didn't pre-plan this or anything like that. I'm going to pick someone from here. So let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. I know you. Come here, Camille. Okay, let's see. Let's see. I'm going to just. I need a guy. I need a guy. Come here, Anon. Let's see. I need another girl, Jill. Come here. Okay, let's see. Y'all come on up over here. Give, a, give our friends a clap. Come on up here as they make their way up here. Oh, y'all awake now. Y'all are awake now. <clears throat> okay, here we go. Y'all stand right over here. Yep, line it up. Here we go. Here we go. Come on over here. Yep, great. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Now, here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to ask you, what is your name? 
and then, so you can tell us what your name is, and then I want you to tell me, I have $200 bills, and then I have a dollar bill, which would you prefer? Okay? All right. My name is Anand. I would prefer the $200, I mean $200 bill. Hold on, hold on, hold on. He wants both. Yeah, $200. Yeah. $100 bill. Amen. $100 bill. Okay. Um, my name is Jill, and I would prefer the $100 bill. Wow. Well, it seems like you might not have a choice here because the two, the hundreds are gone. Can I say what I prefer? Okay. My name's Camille, and I prefer the $100 bill. The $100 bill. Okay, because they claimed it first, it looks like here. I might have to. Okay, so here you go. There goes the hundred dollar bill right there. My hundred dollar bill right there. Sorry, Camille, you're left with the dollar bill. Now here's what I want y'all to do. Okay, I want you to observe this bill. I want you to, you know, take a whiff of it. Smell it. Smell it. Yep. Take a look at it. Yep. Mhm. Mm yep. All right. What's wrong? What's the matter? What have you examined? What have you observed about this? So there's this text on the back of the bill. It, uh, it says, um, motion picture use only. Oh, man. How about you, Jill? Uh, it's not what I expected. <laughs> it's definitely not real, but we, it used to say, like, in God we trust, but it says in PMM we trust. Who is PMM? <laughs> okay, Camille, what have you observed? This is real, and it says, in God we trust. Oh, yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. All right, stay put. This is what distortion looks like, right? It's like it's a version of the real thing. It looks like the real thing, right? It, it's got the blue line. You got Benjamin Franklin's face right there. Like, it literally looks like the real, it looks real good on paper, doesn't it? It looks real good on paper. But sometimes the perception of something can lead you into a false re reality. Am I right? That person, that relationship, man, it looks so good on paper. Serena, man, I, I look through the profile like there's pictures with their mom. They love dogs. They love children. Yeah, but do they love this book right here? Man, I need paper. I just need to stack paper right now. I'm not worried about nothing else. I need to just make that paper. You know what? I, I'm not. But do you know that, that you can be rich in the bank but poor in your spirit? The reality is that this dollar bill actually holds more value than the $100 bills, right? All right, give it up for our friends. But hold on, I feel bad. So here, here's a dollar bill for you yeah. and a dollar bill for you. Go on. Go get something from the vending machine, guys. It's on me tonight. <laughs> so what am I saying? What am I saying, y'all? What am I saying? What am I saying? The more time that you spend studying the truth, the easier it is to identify the counterfeit. I'm going to say that one more time. The more time that you take time studying the truth, the easier that it becomes to identify the counterfeit. It's a muscle. It's a muscle that you just have to start using, right? It gets built up over the years. So initially for some, you know, you create boundaries. You know, for, for, for some it's things like, well, you know what, I can't hang with those, that crew. You know, or I, no, I can't be caught doing those things. Like I can't do that. And doing specific things. And then once you begin to exercise that muscle more and more, decisions become more and more habitual. And it becomes a little bit easier to make decisions. You know, I, I, um, 
I have a dear friend. He's a CEO of, of uh, he's a retired CEO. He's like 75 years old, amazing. George and I just love him. And I was talking to him the other day on the other the other day on the phone, and, and we were just talking about just random stuff, and uh, one of the things that he said, and I just love it, he's just, a, you know, those people that are just like, just so wise, and he's been one of those voices in our lives, but he had said something, he said, the sooner that we recognize what our purpose is, the easier it become, becomes to manage what our pleasures are. So, like, you ask the question, like, God, what is the purpose of my life? What what am I supposed to be doing? God, should I be going after that opportunity? Or is that really just my flesh, like, really wanting to go after that opportunity, right? Because when you understand who you are, then you understand what you're called to do. So some of us, some of you in here, you're called to be in the medical field. Without a shadow of a doubt, that's what you're doing, right? Uh, you're, you're working with, I just met a friend right now. She works with autistic children. God bless you, you know. You're working or you're working in education. And so for you, what that looks like, decisions might look different for you, right? You're called to, to make decisions within just think about it, you're, you're in your world, you're in your whatever board meetings that you're in, in the break room, you know, sometimes they have happy hour afterwards, and you, in these moments, you're called to make decisions a specific way. Some of you are called to ministry, and so decisions in life look different for you as well, but solidify what your purpose is, and then your decisions will become more clear. This is the last thing, and I'm going to end with this. The enemy will always come after what you love. He comes after your worship. And we know that because that's literally the last thing that the devil comes after. You know, there's a simple saying. He says, what you spend your time and energy doing will rule you, and it will become what you worship. See, because you and I, we were created to worship him in, in, in everything. And so when, when we start doing whatever we want to do, we begin to worship that thing. And I'm not saying, you might be like, well, well ask yourself this. What, what do I do when, when I tend to not know what to do? Is it to worry? Is it to doubt? Is it to go talk to someone else before you go and talk to God? And in those moments, you might be like, well, Serena, that's, that's not that I worship fear or worry or doubt. Yeah, but when we tend to do more of that than trusting in God, then we're, it becomes our worship. So whatever that may be, what I'm asking you to do tonight is to do what Jesus did. And he modeled this so well to us. Jesus was tempted, but he showed us that the one solution to it all was to go here. It was to turn to God's word. And, and another thing that I love is in the very last verse or close to the last verse when he says, away from me, Satan. He showed us that if you resist temptation when it comes to making decisions, if you re resist it, it has to go. It has to flee. And, and that's exactly what happened here. The devil left. He's like, all right, I'm out. And immediately the angels came and attended to Jesus. You know what I love about this? There's such good news for you and I. Because you know what happens right after Jesus comes out of the desert? Do you know where he goes? Out of the wilderness, out of the dry place, he begins his life calling. He begins preaching and, and fulfilling his purpose. So that tells me that the desert, the wilderness, that that was an indicator that there is something really big on the other end of it. So maybe tonight you feel like, man, Serena, I feel like I am in the wild. Like I feel like, like I'm in the desert. I am out here. <laughs> Here's what I would say to you. Be encouraged. Something big is on the other side. 
the desert is an indicator that greatness is coming. I love hearing even Ramiro and, and, and Jamie's story and how even when they were in that desert place, they chose to worship God, but they didn't even know that there was a miracle coming on. There was a miracle happening on the inside. The desert is necessary. The desert is necessary in my life to build me, to, to shape me, to, to make me stronger, to launch me into my purpose. I think we need to say that out loud. Would you repeat that out with me? Say, the desert is necessary in my life to build me, to shape me, to make me stronger and launch me into my purpose. See, when I don't know what to do, this is what we do, y'all. We cling to God's word. I hope tonight my prayer is that we would be a people that would be after God's word, that we would fall in love with his word, that we would run to his word over what anyone else says, and that we would know what to do when we don't know what to do. Amen? I hope you receive that tonight, do you?